Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Enrico Letta. I'm the Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, you all in this webinar as a very timely event. And I'm very happy uh, to welcome you all because we are uh, about to discuss on the US elections results and the consequences of this result. Of course, the result is no more there. And uh, we are all aware that our debate will be a debate that will be on uh, the after, the day after, the day after the result that we don't know yet. And of course, we will try to be uh, uh, with our panelists uh, for this uh, time, one hour and a half. We are so pleased with them because they uh, are with us today uh, for uh, terrific panelists today uh, coming from different parts of the world. They are all part of uh, our faculty. They are part of the group of friends of PSIA and I'm more than happy uh, to introduce them. Uh, we will, uh, of course, ask them to uh, say what they think about the uh, next four years at the White House, next four years of foreign uh, US policy. Uh, taking for granted the fact that we don't know yet who is the winner of these elections. And of course, uh, everything is changing uh, uh, minute by minute, uh, but we don't want to follow all the changes minute by minute. So uh, the, the, the key point for us is to uh, discuss on the different scenarios and also on the fact that uh, what is clear is the fact that this election is one of the most controversial uh, and uh, America is divided, is divided in two. Uh, one of the two part will win, but uh, it is true and it's clear that uh, the division within American uh, politics is so deep today. So uh, we'll start from this uh, awareness uh, for our debate uh, for panelists, for great leaders. I thank really uh, um, Peter Ricketts, Ursula Plasnik, Tayo Bark, Bruno Stagno, Ugarte, uh, for great friends, uh, Peter Ricketts, uh, former uh, national security advisor for uh, the uh, British government, uh, former diplomat, at the Foreign Office uh, uh, and uh, great friend of uh, uh, PSIA. Uh, Ursula Plasnik, uh, professor of PSIA, uh, ambassador today uh, of Austria uh, to Switzerland and former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Austria. And of course, I take the opportunity uh, to say how we are sorry uh, to uh, Ursula for what happened uh, two days ago in Vienna and our morning is, uh, uh, we think, the morning of all students of Sciences Po in this very moment. And thank you, Ursula, for being with us uh, today. Tayo Bark, uh, a special thank to Tayo Bark, uh, because for him is one o'clock in the night. Uh, Tayo Bark uh, is connected from Seoul. Tayo Bark uh, is the former Minister for Foreign Trade of uh, uh, South Korea and great professor, great friend of uh, PSIA, founder of the School of Global Studies uh, that is in Seoul National University, one of the uh, uh, good colleague of uh, uh, PSIA, and Bruno Stagno Ugarte, Bruno Stagno Ugarte, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica, a diplomat from Costa Rica, and today uh, director of, at uh, Human Rights Watch and one of the most beloved professors at um, PSIA. Uh, before starting with Peter Ricketts, I would like to ask all our participants, all our students uh, to uh, uh, use WOCLAP. You are all uh, familiar with WOCLAP, uh, uh, how to participate. You have here the connection. Uh, I ask you 
to connect to WOCLAP because I would like to ask you to answer two questions. We will have four questions for uh, our seminar. Two questions immediately now, just to uh, have the kickoff. First question on a scale of uh, one to five, how surprised are you by the results so far? And of course, when I say the result, the result with a no winner. <clears throat> So we were, you were expecting such a, a divided result or such a difficult result because the large majority of our students are answering not at all surprised or somewhat surprised. And I think uh, it is interesting too because it is clear that uh, um, this blue wave that was one of the potential scenarios uh, was at the end of the day more for the media rather than for people uh, uh, really aware of the situation in this very uh, moment in the um, US. So uh, great, thank you, thank you very much. We have a second question. I would like to, uh, you to answer a second question uh, in one word, so just one word. What do you think was the defining issue of the electoral campaign? Please vote. Economy and virus. Economy and virus. But Trump too was the issue of the campaign for someone voting. Yes, COVID, economy, COVID and economy. Uh, Yes, the feeling at the end of the day is that economy first and then COVID, COVID with many different ways to define COVID. So coronavirus, COVID-19, um, but also Trump. So at the end of the day, it was a sort of referendum on Trump uh, and other issues. But at the end of the day, economy and uh, the virus were the two most important issues. So, OK, thank you very much. I stop here because I would like just immediately to give the floor to Peter Ricketts. Peter, you have the floor first. Uh, we will have seven minutes each for our four speakers, then questions and answers. Uh, for the question and answers, you can uh, write on the chat. I ask you, I say immediately, please, very short questions. Uh, so I can take more questions. Peter, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, and hopefully very easy questions as well. Um, thank you, Enrico. Uh, I'm so sorry that we can't all be doing this around a table in Paris uh, in a real meeting, but we will have to make do with this. Um, and uh, I look forward to a really stimulating discussion. Thank you for organizing it. As you say, we don't know how the result will come out. Uh, I thought it was very interesting, the answer to that second question, that the economy came up so large. I personally think that that is right. I think actually the economy has perhaps been a bigger issue even than the pandemic, which may explain some of the reasons that the pollsters again got it wrong. But however it comes out, um, nearly half or slightly more than half the American people will have voted again for Donald Trump, knowing what Donald Trump will do, how he will behave in the next four years. I think that's quite an important point just to register at the beginning, because it reminds us all how divided, how angry and polarized America is today. Uh, Joe Biden, if he wins, has to take that into account. It looks like he would also have to work with a Republican Senate, which will also be a material factor. So in my now six minutes, I thought I would um, list three things that I think won't change whoever wins the White House in the foreign policy area, and three things that will change definitely if Biden wins. And I note that foreign policy didn't really figure in that uh, diagram uh, of answers. I think China was there. So it wasn't perhaps the major issue, but it's the major issue for all of us on this call. So what wouldn't change um, if uh, you know, whoever wins, Biden or Trump? First of all, um, the top economic and security priority for the US will remain Asia. The confrontation with China will continue, uh, whichever one wins the White House. That's as 
as at least as much a result of Xi Jinping's much more nationalist and aggressive approach than it is um, a US initiative. And although Biden would probably put less emphasis on tariff wars, I think he and both houses of Congress would have the same determination to prevent China dominating either Asia Pacific region or next generation high tech. Second thing that wouldn't change, um, and this is more in the area of Professor Bach, but I think the hard nosed American approach to trade negotiations would not change. Um, the Biden administration would need to show that they were defending American jobs and the American economy. And so I don't think either the EU or the UK could expect um, an early, uh, certainly not a straightforward trade deal. Thirdly, the retreat from um, interventionism in the world will continue. Uh, it was already well underway when Joe Biden was vice president to Barack Obama. Um, it's very notable to me that Trump was prepared to talk very tough as the president towards North Korea at one point, then towards Iran, but never did actually engage the US in new military conflicts. And I think that Biden would continue that retreat uh, from exposed military activities around the world. That has implications for us in Europe. I think that the Americans would remain as reticent about interventions in crises near, near uh, our neighborhood, like Syria, uh, like Ukraine, like Belarus has been in recent years. Uh, and that has implications for European um, security and defense. Three things now quickly that I think would change very sharply under a President Biden. First, and perhaps the most defining difference would be his approach to multilateralism. Uh, a Biden presidency would mean America was back in the global conversation, trying to solve global threats. Um, most importantly of all, and most immediately on climate change, uh, Biden has said he would apply to rejoin the COP um, uh, climate process on the first day of being president. He would commit to a zero carbon target. I think he would rejoin the WHO uh, and subject to Professor Bach, I think he would uh, want to also re-engage quickly with the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement and the WTO. No doubt he would push American interests hard, um, but he would be there as part of the conversation again. That's important for the UK because uh, we will be hosting both the uh, climate conference and the G7 summit in 2021. Second thing that would change is his approach to allies in both NATO and in Asia. He understands the value of allies. He would probably rejoin the Iran nuclear negotiations, but he would have tough asks of his allies. Uh, for NATO nations, I'm sure it would be increase your defense spending. And for all US allies, it would be join us in the uh, broad effort to end reliance on China for high tech uh, manufacturing um, uh, and critical thing that would change is an approach to authoritarian and populist rulers like Putin, like Kim Jong-un, and in a rather different way, uh, like um, President Erdogan and, and Bolsonaro. Uh, I think that Joe Biden by instinct is an institutional person. He will work through the institutions. He will work much better with allies. He will be less attracted to this very personalized um, style of, of diplomacy that um, Trump is so attracted to. So American foreign policy would return to a more familiar style and a more familiar tone. But I think we shouldn't be under any illusion that under President Biden, he wouldn't be putting the clocks back to um, what it was like, for example, in the Obama period. Uh, America has changed in the last four years and uh, a Biden presidency would reflect that. I won't spend any more time uh, on the issue of what it would be like if, if Donald Trump returns. I mean, we know um, how Trump behaves. Um, his instincts would remain the same. I would not expect him to be mellowed in his second term. If anything, I would expect him to be even more unconstrained in following his instincts. Enrico, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I leave the floor immediately to Ursula Plasnik. Uh, of course, you are among the four 
speakers, the one who comes from uh, European Union country, Ursula. So I uh, think your point, I'm so sorry, Peter, for that. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I think Ursula, you can uh, 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 share with us also some ideas on which kind of relationship uh, the new president of the US will have uh, with the European Union. Ursula, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Enrico. Thank you, Marie Zenaida and Psia for convening us on this uh, uh, date, on this day of high uh, drama. Now, before I go into uh, the details of the European Union approach to the US and to global politics, let me just make a, a couple of short remarks on what makes these uh, elections unique, because every election is about either continuity or change. That's not special. But what makes these presidential elections 22 unique from my perspective are essentially three elements. One is the pandemic. Uh, we do not know at this uh, moment how this is going to affect the economies and the societies around the globe. This is a huge task whichever way it does, and it uh, would require united uh, forces uh, on both sides of the Atl Atlantic and really on the side of uh, global governance as well. Now, uh, a lot of uncertainty here. The second element that makes these um, elections unique in a way is that there is profound insecurity in American society about uh, their international, national identity, about a number of questions. This goes, uh, and this is unprecedented, as far as challenging the very system, the very democratic foundations of the system, uh, the electoral process, the elections as such, one vote, every vote counts. Uh, we have not had a situation where the top representative uh, the person who owes his function to the electoral process challenges this process from within. I think this is quite uh, important to uh, figure this out because it will mean a lot for us, for uh, democracy around the world. Europeans have confidence in the American system, including the electoral system. We do have the patience to wait for the results we all know from our own experience that voting takes time and counting takes time. But this is an element that is, uh, uh, does not have a precedent. And uh, uh, maybe the third element, and this has already been pointed out by Peter, is that we are at a defining moment of a geopolitical new order that is emerging. And uh, uh, there you have uh, a lot of questions for a lot of countries. Um, including the smaller and medium-sized countries. And I come from Austria, I live in Switzerland now, and uh, um, I uh, realize that a lot of countries are watching these uh, elections with particular attention because they are looking for their place in the geostrategic competition that is going on, rivalry that is going on between the United States and China. This as a first remark. The second remark on uh, um, European Union. Now, um, of course, these elections are to a certain extent a stress test for European unity. European unity that has been strengthened, and I say that uh, with a sad look to Peter, by Brexit. People adhere to the European project, difficult as it may be, imperfect as it is, but uh, Brexit and after Brexit experience means that Europeans are uh, pulling closer uh, together. Now, um, we see already in the first reactions to the American electoral process that are coming in now, that it is not so easy to keep the unity in practical terms. There will be uh, heads of government uh, who will comment, congratulate, there will be those who do it early. There will be those who have the patience to wait. So this is going to be uh, a first element of uh, how we keep uh, together. Now, uh, the European Union, and that is, uh, and will we make the difference uh, with uh, the United States, uh, is a champion of multilateralism. What does multilateralism mean? It's such a dry word, uh, and it's such an abstract thing, but it means 
the opposite of unilateralism. It means that there are several people in the room, several people always around the table. There are uh, uh, negotiations ongoing. There is a constant exchange. There is a constant balancing and uh, a search for inclusiveness. Uh, now, this is not going to change about the European Union because this is the very foundation of the European Union. It's, it's the DNA, and it would be awkward to imagine that the European Union would uh, 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 promote other values, uh, another approach uh, to international uh, issues. Now, um, if you look at uh, European public opinion, um, an interesting element, I have looked into a Bertels, recent uh, Bertelsmann study, and uh, what we can see is that there is a, a, a definite preference in the European public opinion when it comes to the candidates for presidency. It is actually 45% uh, uh, in favor of Biden and 70% in favor of Trump, with one big exception, and that is Poland, where the ratio is 38% in favor of Trump and 30 in favor of uh, Biden. But there is also, and that's probably more surprising and upsetting, um, a disbelief, uh, a loss of faith of European public opinion in the performance of American democracy. A majority, 52%, believe it is ineffective. Now, what does that mean for the future of our relationship with the United States? Um, I would like to pass that question on to students. I would like them to think about if they were the architects of the future relationship between European Union and the United States, how would they describe this uh, relationship? If they were the architects, not the bystanders and those who are just watching something happening on stage. Great, thank you. Uh, you have the uh, third question. So define the core of the future EU-US relationship as you want it to be. And, and thank you, Ursula, of course, for your Comments? I'm not finished. Oh, okay. I will go on for a second if I have a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we will uh, give uh, time now for students to feed in their answers. And I think so. You can you can comment also the the answers. Great. Trust, cooperation, independence, partnership. Autonomy, anti-China, that's interesting. Non-Western centric, collaborative. Okay, very good. Uh, Ursula, you have the floor to Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your input. I think that all of you are right. This is going to be part of the uh, puzzle and part of the job to do for European uh, leaders at this moment uh, in time. And it will also be decisive for the new, new geopolitical environment, for the scenery. Where is the European Union going to place? Can we do it our way? Uh, the so-called Sinatra doctrine, Europe does it its way, or will we uh, have to um, uh, act in a different way? Now, um, maybe the, word of, uh, the words of pragmatic partnership might uh, be a good way to describe the future of this relationship. There is a definite sobering uh, feeling in, uh, among the European population with regard to relationships with uh, 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 the United States and uh, uh, politicians will have to take that into account. But there is, however, and that's also a Bertelsmann uh, study uh, result, uh, there is a big preference if you ask Europeans about who their closest partner is in the global village outside uh, Europe. And this is definitely uh, the United States of America. Now, where will the European Union need and want to cooperate with the United States, whoever is the president elected? Um, there will be two dimensions, essentially. One is the immediate neighborhood of uh, the European Union, if we can call it so. It starts with Belarus, with, uh, 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 with the Ukraine, of course, with our relationship with the Russian Federation. Then we have the Balkans, uh, we have the Mediterranean, our difficult relationship with Turkey. 
the southern Mediterranean with the migratory waves that keep uh, coming into uh, Europe. Uh, we have uh, uh, the Middle East. Here we are on the, on the uh, threshold to truly uh, global issues. On the global side, the European Union, with its own way of doing things, uh, uh, will have to take the lead on a number of issues together with America. Uh, or in a, a, a maybe a, a bit thorny kind of partnership uh, inside the United Nations system. Uh, let me just mention WHO in the pandem pandemic, one of the uh, major instruments of uh, uh, cooperation that the Americans uh, have announced they would uh, leave in the case of uh, Trump winning the elections. But there is also uh, Iran. There is the question of whether we can uh, revive the JCPOA uh, with Iran or not. Climate change, uh, Peter Ricketts has mentioned it as one of the issues on the front. So on all these issues, the European Union will want to cooperate, will find a strategy, uh, a, a line of communication and more than that, uh, a cooperation as close as possible based on as many common values, shared values as possible for the future. So uh, sober conclusion of my remarks for the European Union, the homework is on the table. The comfort zone is behind us. Uh, there might be a change in tone and in tools, but there is not going to be a change when it comes to the issues, to our interests, and to the way we are going to approach uh, these issues in a pragmatic partnership with the United States. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ursula. Really, uh, we appreciate it. Um, Theo Bark from Seoul, uh, thank you uh, because you are with us. It is one o'clock, it is more than one o'clock, it's one and a half o'clock in the night uh, in Seoul. So many thanks for being with us, uh, Theo Bark is one of the leading experts at world level on uh, WTO, on uh, uh, trade issues, uh, global trade issues. And uh, so we are very pleased to uh, have you on this panel and it would be fantastic to have your thoughts on the future of the uh, WTO and the future. We know that WTO is in these very days at the uh, last, uh, uh, decision on the new leader uh, that will take uh, the uh, place of uh, Mr. Acevedo. And uh, uh, of course, the new president of the US or Trump or Biden will uh, have a great responsibility in the future of uh, uh, global trade. What do you think about it? What, what are your thoughts, uh, dear Theo? You have the floor. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Enrico for inviting me uh, to this uh, very special webinar uh, at uh, PSIA. Uh, although, as you say, it's uh, almost, you know, one o'clock, uh, one and a half uh, uh, a.m. in the morning uh, in Seoul, I'm very happy to be connected with the PSIA. I used to visit, as you say, uh, to give a lecture uh, at PSIA uh, in the past. I would now like to make a brief uh, initial remarks. Uh, as you know, all of us have been very much anxious about the result of the US election, which is yet to be finalized. One of the reasons uh, seems to me for this anxiety would be the role of the US and its president in dealing with numerous global challenges, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, intensifying competition between US and China, and ever weakening multilateral trading system. Since I'm a trade expert by training and practice, I would like to take this opportunity to discuss a few important trade related issues and suggest some uh, possible solutions. Let me start with a few words on the US-China trade disputes. There seem to be three key issues behind the US-China trade disputes. The first controversial issue is the developing country status of China. The US and other advanced countries expected China to expand its market opening and embrace international trade rules 
after its accession to the WTO in 2001. However, China neither liberalized much of its market nor fully accepted the WTO rules, claiming that it still maintains the developing country status at the WTO. The second issue relates to China's improper protection of intellectual properties and cutting edge technologies of foreign companies. The third issue, a uh, very important issue, is the problem of China's state capitalism. The Chinese government provides unlimited subsidies to specific industries as well as companies and helps uh, state-owned enterprises. However, the measures the U.S. has taken so far include imposing tariffs on Chinese products, restricting exports to China, asking China to purchase more U.S. goods and services and so on. I don't think these measures are enough to correct the fundamental problems. Rather, imposing tariffs on Chinese goods may have hurt the U.S. consumers and distorted global trade flows. So I hope the U.S. to change its approach and focus more on inducing China to accept fair trade rules and expand market opening in the future. Maybe it depends on you know, who will become a president. Uh, this issue will become much more vital uh, in the future. Let me now move to another major trade issues. It would be important to realize that the China-US uh, issues are not only the concern of the US, but also threatens the world trade order. However, the current multilateral trading system of the WTO is unable to address the issues involved in the US-China trade disputes. In addition, WTO's first multilateral trade negotiations launched in 2001 failed making the WTO extremely outdated. Furthermore, the appointment of new judges of the WTO's appellate body for dispute settlement was blocked by the US actually. And recently the election as Enrico mentions of the WTO's new director general has been stalled. In short, the WTO faces serious challenges and needs the fundamental reform. However, it will be extremely difficult to reach a consensus on the reform among 164 members. Therefore, some other options may be sought for in parallel with the WTO reform efforts. For example, plurilateral trade agreements, we call PTAs, among like-minded countries, uh, like-minded members of WTO should be allowed. And these PTAs, should be open to all WTO members so that they can uh, join the agreement later when the right time comes. Also, high standard regional trade agreement may be pursued. Already uh, it is mentioned that maybe by, if Biden become a president, maybe he will go back to the TPP or expand the you know, current so-called TPP, uh, CPTPP members to include other countries. And if the Trump is uh, elected, I mean re-elected, then maybe he will pursue for so-called uh, economic uh, prosperity network to include some countries in, 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 in the uh, Asia Pacific uh, kind of region. Lastly, but not least, I'd like to raise one more serious problem of the leadership crisis of the current multilateral trading system. As as we all know, the US played a major role in establishing the multilateral trading system of the WTO in 1995. However, recently the US has changed its position and does not pay much attention to the multilateral trading system. Rather, the US is taking unilateral as well as bilateral approaches based on its own economic power to secure only its own interests. Many trade experts are thinking that these approaches will not be sustained. Now is the time for the US to show the leadership again for reshaping the world trading system. However, the US cannot do this job alone and definitely needs other like-minded countries 
like the EU, UK, maybe Korea, Australia, Canada, and so on, to work together with. Reshaping the world trading system may not be easy and it may take time. However, the simple fact the US start to pay attention to stabilizing the world trading system will make huge contribution to reducing uncertainties in the world trade environment. Certainly, this will help the world recover from economic recession caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll stop here and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, dear Tayo Bark. Uh, uh, I give the floor now to our fourth uh, speaker, last but not least, Bruno Stagno Ugarte. Uh, there are many issues, Bruno, you can uh, uh, share with us, many thoughts you can share with us, but I think your experience that is mostly based on multilateralism and human rights, so I would like to ask you to focus on maybe on these two aspects, your uh, contribution. You have the floor, Bruno. Well, thanks, Enrico, first of all, for the invitation and um, the pleasure to be with, um, with these colleagues. Let me start maybe with um, three short observations. First, that the United States obviously plays an oversized role in multilateralism, for better or for worse. Um, it was obviously one and probably was the main architect of the post-World War II multilateral order that I think many of us are beholden to and that we would like to defend. Secondly, that the United States has in the past gone through periods of isolationism, which have then been followed by renewed commitments to multilateralism, and that this has not necessarily followed party lines. And third, that there has been probably a unique intensity and unique unpredictability in the ways that the Trump administration and President Trump himself has withdrawn from parts of the very international order that the United States helped to create. And um, other colleagues have referenced some of this, but from the withdrawal from the World Health Organization, just as the world is being hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, to the withdrawal from the United Nations Human Rights Council, to the defunding of the United Nations Refugee Agency, um, the defunding of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, the defunding of United Nations peacekeeping operations, and has, a, as has already been referenced to the withdrawal of uh, Obama era agreements, such as the Paris Accords and uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran. And in my sense, it unfortunately took some time for um, United States allies to recognize the degree to which the Trump administration would become isolationist and question the utility and even the legitimacy of multilateral institutions. And that it, there has been a gradual reckoning that over-reliance on the United States in foreign policy, and I would add in security matters, may no longer be a winning strategy. Um, that the United States is in some ways no longer viewed in some capitals as the indispensable or reliable power it may have been in the past. And that this rude awakening um, has the potential, I think, even if there is a second Trump administration, but without the Trump administration being a player in this, to increase and to improve international cooperation and coordination amongst traditional US allies and democracies. These very same allies and democracies that as I think Peter mentioned, um, have been largely um, had a harder time navigating the vagaries of the Trump administration than the autocrats and plutocrats that uh, President Trump has at times celebrated. Now, if there is a Biden administration, it will obviously need to do considerable repairs to many of the damaged relationships and alliances, as well as reaffirming the commitment of the United States to what have been longstanding commitments by this city on a shining hill, as it traditionally has tried to portray itself. And um, in light of what you have asked, I'll, I'll basically 
in the remaining minutes, try to address some areas pertaining to human rights, where I think that there will be some very dramatic differences between a potential second Trump administration and a potential Biden administration. First, because I am convinced that the US is really at a fork on the road with regards to its commitment to human rights, period. Under the Trump administration, um, Secretary of State Pompeo has wanted to wind back the clock to 1948 and to somehow wish away all the human rights treaties that have been adopted since the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Um, he has presided over the creation of something that is called the Commission on Inalienable Rights, which really constitutes a frontal assault on international human rights law because it basically wants to open the door to an a la carte approach to human rights obligations. And it serves as an excuse to repress, to discriminate and to abuse when these obligations basically run counter to United States interests. The United States has also withdrawn from the United Nations Human Rights Council, which I think was ill-advised. But frankly, this has not ultimately had much of a negative effect on the council. And in fact, since the withdrawal of the United States, the seat was taken up by Iceland. Iceland did a remarkable role. And the council has continued to deliver quite strong outcomes on very serious country-specific human rights situations. And this notwithstanding, obviously, one of the legitimate issues that the United States has with the Human Rights Council, which is its flawed membership. But I'm also convinced that the United States is at a fork on the road with regards to its commitment to accountability and the fight against uh, impunity writ large for mass atrocity crimes. And in this regard, the executive order that was signed by President Trump earlier this year and the sanctions that were adopted against the International Criminal Court targeting the prosecutor of the court with targeted sanctions that were designed for terrorists and drug traffickers is really a travesty. And this is really at odds with past cooperation that has existed between the United States and the court, even under the George W. Bush administration, which obviously had an initial animosity against this court. Some of you may remember Mr. Bolton's mission to basically undermine the ICC already back in the George W. Bush administration. But I'm also convinced that um, under a second Trump administration, we are very likely to see an increasingly regressive approach by the United States on human rights, a doubling down of its vision of inalienable rights and a rising opposition to key human rights institutions, such as the Human Rights Council, the International Criminal Court, and others. On the other hand, a Biden administration would likely end such opposition. Without it, however, embracing the Rome Statute, I would not expect the US to ratify the Rome Statute, if for no other reason that the Republicans would continue to control the Senate, which obviously is tasked with ratification of treaties. But as has already been mentioned, there would very likely be a recommitment by a Biden administration to the World Health Organization as we continue to be in the midst of fighting COVID-19. And probably I would say also a recommitment to the United Nations Refugee Agency. And these are two institutions where the United States has traditionally been the largest funder. So this would be very, very welcome. Now I'm, I'm very much convinced that we're in a defining moment for multilateralism in general. And yet this is regardless of how the United States election goes. And even if there is a Trump, a second Trump administration, I don't think it needs to be a fatal blow to international cooperation and coordination. I think countries and societies have learned a certain degree of resilience, which maybe they didn't have in the past because of their over-reliance on the United States. Um, so I think that it's not necessarily a bad thing um, that there is less reliance and a growing independence from the United States, so long, of course, as it's not the revisionist powers that get the upper hand on multilateralism. And this is where it really requires that all democracies and all those allies that are committed to the multilateral setting really recommit to multilateralism um, and international law and human rights and to defend and to build the conquests of the past. And I know that uh, Peter obviously being from the UK probably knows this better, but 
Winston Churchill said that democracy was the worst system with the exception of all others. In many ways, multilateralism is also the worst system with the exception of all others. And so there's really no other avenue but to pursue multilateralism, be it with or without the United States. And hopefully the United States will be a full player and partner as it has been in the past. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a fourth question. I would like to, to uh, ask uh, all our uh, uh, students to, uh, to vote. There's a, a fourth uh, up. Uh, uh, the question is, in one word, what do you think the results so far mean for international affairs more broadly? Please vote. <clears throat> in one word, what do you think this, the results so far mean for international affairs more broadly? Uncertainty. Uncertainty is the number one. Then polarization, uh, caution, vacuum, danger. I see danger, segmentation, fragmentation. Yeah, uncertainty and polarization, division, fear, disorientation. <clears throat> Yeah, it seems a very interesting situation. So I would like to start with, uh, with questions. I start with two questions to Peter. You ready, Peter? First question coming from our one YouTube uh, audience. Uh, the question is the following one. If the US uh, with Biden or with Trump continues its retreat from engaging in military conflict, what will deter China from advancing in Hong Kong, Taiwan, or the South China Sea? That is the first question. I read also a second question, Pauline Crepy, is a question about the uncertainty, uh, the uncertainty because of uh, uh, this uh, election and the uh, lack of the result, what impact would, would this have on the US stock market economy in the coming days? What is your feeling, Peter, on these two questions? Well, thank you very much indeed. Two very big questions. Um, on the retreat from uh, internationalism, um, I think that that is true where America decides that its key national interests are no longer at stake. And um, I think as other panelists have said, Ursula in particular, uh, I think they have calculated that um, they do not have vital interests at stake often in Europe, in Europe's neighborhood, uh, or nowadays often in the Middle East. Um, they have clearly stepped back from this terrible crisis in Syria, haven't made a big effort to um, resolve that crisis would have done in previous decades. I think they do still see their vital interests as engaged in the Asia Pacific area, um, and in particular on Taiwan, which has always been a flashpoint in the US political system. So I don't see that the Americans will retreat from their commitments in Taiwan or their presence um, in and around uh, Taiwan and uh, the South China Sea. Because I think, going back to what we were saying earlier, uh, I think they are determined to prevent China from becoming the dominant power in the Asia Pacific area. Uh, and equally, I think China has set out on a path to try to force the Americans out uh, on their famous nine dash line out beyond the island chain. So I think that um, America will replace its previous preoccupation with security in um, the Middle East and Europe with a closer attention to um, competing with China uh, in that area. I don't say going to war with China, although military uh, incidents are always possible by miscalculation. Hong Kong is a different point. Hong Kong, um, clearly America is not going to go with, to war with China over Hong Kong, but Britain and China, uh, the US have very major interests in Hong Kong. Britain has a particular 
moral commitment to Hong Kong as well. The competition around Hong Kong over um, this reputation in the world, um, sanctions on China if they uh, continue their uh, pressure on Hong Kong to impose these draconian national security laws there. I think that's a political and economic uh, part of the relationship with China. But I think Taiwan, South China, remain an area of US military engagement um, to keep Chinese ambitions in check and to put some pressure against them. On, on the of um, how long could um, a president hang on to office after um, it became clear in the end that he lost, others will have views on this as well. I think uh, the reaction of the US stock market would quite quickly, it was clear that, um, that he'd been found to have lost, but still to be hanging on. I think a critical audience to watch would be the Republicans in Congress, particularly the Republicans in the Senate, who would have to be calculating as well the damage uh, on them uh, and on uh, America's economic prospects more widely. And it might be that it would have to come down to Republican senators to put the president and tell him that time was up um, once the pressure got. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, question uh, to uh, Bruno Stagno Ugarte, Jose Pablo Castro Salazar. I would like to ask Stagno Ugarte if he sees major differences between a Biden and Trump administration concerning US Latin America relations. Bruno. Um, yes, yes. For the, first of all, for the very simple reason that under uh, the Obama administration, um, President uh, Obama and obviously Vice President Biden at the time were very much engaged in trying to uh, maintain a certain degree of, uh, I, I guess, coherence and dialogue that would run from uh, Alaska all the way to um, Tierra del Fuego. Um, and this is something that's, that is sorely in the region, um, as we've seen political uh, and ideological, um, I would say extremism take, um, uh, take hold in some countries of, of, of the region, specifically in, in Latin America with the ALBA group. And I do think that President Biden, if, if elected, um, would engage with a number of Latin American countries in much less transactional terms, recognizing that, for example, the migrant flows coming from the Northern Triangle in Central America and going through Mexico require um, a joint coordination between the US, Mexico, and uh, the three countries of the Northern Triangle. That engaging, for example, in terms of addressing um, some of the drug trafficking issues or insurgency issues that could continue to still affect Colombia requires also a less transactional approach than maybe what President Trump has been using to date. Um, but also that it's going to change some of the balances because presidents like Bolsonaro um, would probably now have to sing a different tune. They would no longer be the ones who let's say are received with the red carpets in the White House. It would probably be others, others which have a much more credible attachment to the rule of law, to democracy and to human rights. And so I think that there is going to be a very sharp difference if we do indeed see a Biden administration. But at the same time, I wouldn't set too many hopes up. Latin America and the Caribbean, I think will all, always be pretty much a second if not a third order priority in light of the many other issues that some of the other colleagues have mentioned pertaining to the Middle East and China and others, which obviously occupy a much more prominent role in U.S. security and foreign policy. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tayo Bark, uh, a question for you. In case of a close race, it might take at least a week to count all votes or even longer if there's a legal challenge. What would this uncertainty mean for global partners? Julia Rose uh, for 
uh, this question. I uh, add also the fact that in these very days, there's in these very weeks, uh, the uh, world leaders, they have to decide on, for instance, the two leaders of uh, WTO and OECD. And uh, of course, the US plays a very important role on, on both. Theo, what, what is your feeling about it? Well, um, Korea is, uh, uh, US is very important uh, country to Korea uh, because we are surrounded by uh, China, Japan, and also North Korea. But uh, if you look at the policy uh, directions of the, these two potential uh, uh, president of the United States are uh, a little bit different to, to each other. Uh, so uh, our government is also very much anxious to know who, who will become the president, uh, the new president of the United States, because um, in terms of our relationship with the North Korea, North Korea, uh, United States relations, and, and also US and China relations, because if U.S. Uh, like uh, under Trump administration pushes uh, much, you know, pressure to uh, private companies uh, in terms of uh, sanctions on Huawei and things like that, Korean companies are thinking how to uh, respond to this kind of further pressure on uh, China by the United States. However, if the Biden become a president, maybe we are expecting some milder or more systematic approach to China, then uh, private companies can be can prepare their future directions in a more stable way. So we are very much anxious to know who will become our next president. In terms of selecting uh, the new DG, uh, Director General of the WTO, is a very uh, tricky issue right now because um, you know, the, the WTO, you know, the Troika who, who, who manage the uh, uh, election process for new, new director general, they tend to uh, announce the, the uh, minister Ngoji to be a, a new director general uh, with the majority support. And eventually uh, we could, you know, the, the WTO, uh, the Troika think that they can uh, reach the consensus but in the final minute, the uh, U.S. Uh, strongly uh, object to that idea and uh, suddenly announced the support for Korean candidate. So, uh, you know, we really don't know what will happen, but it also depends on, to some extent, who become a president of the United States. Like uh, if the Trump uh, is reelected, then uh, we can expect a huge, you know, confusion because already U.S. has a strong position against uh, you know, Nigerian uh, candidate. That doesn't mean that the rest of the country will support uh, our, 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 our candidate. So it will have a huge confusion. But if, the, uh, Bi if Biden uh, become a president, I think uh, he will make some uh, very uh, you know, forthcoming uh, kind of consultation with the WTO and come up with a very nice solution. I don't know which one, which direction uh, he will take, but uh, we prefer, uh, you know, to see uh, Biden's, uh, you know, kind of compromise with other countries in selecting the final uh, new DG. I, by, by the way, I met a uh, uh, new ambassador uh, from Canada in Korea. He gave me the name of the candidate who is running for OECD Secretary General. So they are now starting to uh, campaign already. I don't know, you know, how much, how many people would be competing to each other. I'll stop here, and Nico. Uh, thank you for for the OECD. There are ten in the race now, ten uh, candidates for the race, and I think very good people. Uh, and uh, and we will see. Um, there's a very interesting question I was preparing uh, to this question, uh, Peter, uh, but make it iceberg. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Ricketts and Mrs. Plasnik. It has been speculated that Prime Minister Johnson is waiting and hoping for Trump to become president again so that he can establish a trade deal with the US and not with the EU. What do you think about this and what do you think it could mean for the EU if this happens? 
uh, maybe Peter and then Ursula. Indeed, I'm very interested to hear Ursula's view on that. Um, yes, that view certainly, and there is a part of the British political system, the Conservative Party, who believe that uh, a Trump victory would put the UK on a rapid path to a free trade agreement with the US, uh, and that that would be a major help to Britain's economy. Um, I don't actually think either of those things are true. First of all, uh, under President Trump, the US has driven extremely hard bargains in all their free trade agreements. And I have no reason to believe that would be different with the UK. I don't think any nostalgia or sentimentality would come into it. Secondly, the Congress will watch very closely to see the impact of Brexit on Northern Ireland. There's a very strong um, Irish lobby in Congress. Um, and uh, particularly if Britain pursues a no deal Brexit and um, makes life more difficult for both parts of Ireland over the issue of the border between the North and the South of Ireland, then I think Congress will be very tough about um, accepting, probably won't accept a, a free trade agreement with the UK. So it's not a question of who is in the White House. It's also a question of Congress. Um, but even if there's a President Trump, I think the UK would have to expect a very tough trade deal would have to take some very difficult decisions about whether to accept US standards, for example, on uh, chlorine washed chicken and hormone uh, fed beef and the other very sensitive issues about agricultural products. Um, and even if we did get a free trade agreement with the US, um, the British government's data show that it would only be a fraction, uh, a fractional help to our gross domestic product, far, far less than we would lose when we leave the EU. So it is no way a compensation for that. So from all those points of view, uh, yes, it's certainly um, a, a view around in the UK political debate. Um, I on honestly don't think that it's well-founded um, and that in the end, whoever is in the White House, uh, Mr. Johnson's gonna have a hard time in getting a free trade agreement that makes a big difference to the UK economy. Uh, thank you, thank you, um, uh, uh, Peter. And Ursula, I add a second question to you, a very interesting question, as she'll go Mofra, to Ursula Plasnik, if Trump were to be re-elected, do you think that it would encourage a country like Germany to adopt more of a leadership role in Europe? And if so, do you think it would be accepted by the other members? Ursula. Thank you so much. Uh, first on... Um... Uh, the trade deals uh, of the United Kingdom, little to add to what Peter just said, uh, expect a tough trade deal. He's better placed to analyze this aspect. Um, I do believe uh, that the United Kingdom needs both. There obviously is a huge need for having an agreement with the European Union. This proves to be a difficult exercise, but then again, nobody expected this to be easy. Uh, uh, I hope we are on a good path here. Um, and the sobering uh, um, uh, climate of the present uh, situation, international situation has reached everybody. So let's be realistic, let's be sober. There are no gifts around. Uh, I do not expect the, the United uh, States, by the way, uh, to deal in any way differently with uh, uh, the European Union than before. There are hardcore interests on the commercial, on the trade side. Uh, and we have to, we better get braced for uh, rough rights here. Um, on the other, uh, but it's interesting to note and it will be interesting to watch in real life uh, whether it does make a difference that uh, the two candidates have taken very explicit uh, different positions on Brexit, Joe Biden being uh, a very uh, anti explicit anti Brexit uh, uh, person, and uh, we know about the attitude of. Uh, Donald Trump. Now on uh, more leadership in uh, the European Union. Um, in a way, in uh, four years ago, one of the expectations we had in the European Union was that uh, Trump was going to be the midwife of a stronger, more united and more focused Europe. To a certain degree, this is happening uh, uh, despite Brexit. 
uh, it is happening in the sense that there is a growing awareness uh, of uh, the security dimension of European policy. Uh, there is a growing uh, uh, readiness uh, to tap into national budgets, which is uh, not the easiest thing to do, uh, but there is an increase in defense spending. Um, so uh, it takes time inside the European Union. Uh, what about Germany? Germany um, <laughs> does have a natural lead position together with France inside the European Union, that is no secret. Uh, Germany is very carefully calibrating uh, its policy. Uh, I also uh, have a sympathy for the fact that uh, what happened to Europe in the, or what Europe had to witness after the 9-11 events uh, uh, was, uh, did not make it easier um, for the common foreign policy and security policy side inside the European Union to develop. Um, this applies to a number of uh, uh, countries, uh, the engagement in Afghanistan, the engagement in Iraq, uh, uh, were uh, difficult experiences for European societies. Germany has been uh, aware and is aware that uh, uh, it will be looked uh, to as a, a leader inside Europe. They do it together with France, which is the basis of the European Union anyhow. And uh, one of the good things about uh, Germany is that they do have a keen sense uh, for smaller neighbors, uh, and they will need it uh, in the years to come uh, to rally support for balanced positions uh, of the European Union. Uh, thank you, Ursula. Uh, two questions for, uh, for Bruno. One question, Lise Brumont on human rights, do you believe it is possible to keep strengthening or even maintain the human rights system as it exists now without US input in case Donald Trump were elected? And what kind of trans transformations does the system need to go through in order to keep functioning efficiently? And a second question, uh, Bruno, uh, is about the fact that considering how close the result will be and the likely loss of the US, US Senate, Senate uh, for the Democrats, will a Biden administration actually have the necessary mandate in order to bring about the changes, reversals necessary? Uh, so a question about uh, also the way in which if Biden wins, uh, uh, is it a, a lamb duck as we uh, uh, used to say, uh, Bruno. So uh, thanks, Enrico, and thanks for the questions. No, I, I think on the second one, I don't think that Biden, if elected, is necessarily a lame duck president. Um, while it is very possible that the Republicans may retain the Senate, it seems very possible that the Democrats will retain the House of Representatives. Um, the President of the United States has considerable powers in terms of foreign policy, national security policy. Um, and while it is true that the Senate is obviously tasked with ratification, the United States has cooperated in, in many parts of the multilateral order without necessarily having ratified the constituent treaties. Um, as I mentioned in earlier, it has cooperated with the ICC without being a state party to the ICC. Um, it has worked on rights of children with that, with, without being a party to the Convention on the Rights of, of the Child. Um, where, where I think um, the Senate can obviously be an obstacle is in terms of blocking uh, appointments to high level positions. But um, I would hope that the Republicans would recognize that that ultimately is a bit of a um, um, self-defeating strategy. Um, in light of the fact, first of all, that the Democrats have shown considerable willingness to go ahead with at times quite questionable high level appointments by Trump over the Trump administration. I'm thinking, for example, of Gina Haspel, the director of the CIA. And, and ultimately, the executive has the power of, of doing provisional appointments, um, which is obviously not, not the best thing to do, but that is an alternative in case the, the Senate blocks. In terms of maintaining expanding the human rights system. Obviously, it's much better if the United States is fully engaged and wants to be a constructive partner. 
But I think that even under these four years of President Trump, we have seen some really interesting things that have been novel precedents that are quite extraordinary. One of them has been, for example, the small country of Gambia, utilizing the Convention on the Prevention of Genocide and taking Myanmar to the International Court of Justice, which is a totally novel um, development, uh, which will probably have some type of uh, um, replications elsewhere in the future. And a second one is Liechtenstein having established through the United Nations General Assembly a very novel mechanism, once again, a quasi-prosecutorial mechanism, which is the closest thing to an accountability mechanism that we have for the crimes committed in Syria by all parties. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that these things happen with, with very small states like Gambia and Liechtenstein leading, I think basically shows that it's still possible, notwithstanding tremendous odds, to improve on, on the systems uh, of, of the human rights system. Um, even if you have uh, an administration like the Trump administration that is operating against it. Um, and I would hope that in fact, more states will find the courage and the initiative that Liechtenstein, Gambia and others have shown so that the human rights system is even bolder and delivers more efficiently than it has. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Uh, have uh, Veronica Saletti, a question uh, to, uh, I would like to ask uh, Peter to answer. The feeling is that during this campaign, the image of American politics has been damaged and the United States has lost its role of world leader concerning democratic and liberal values. Do you think in case of Biden's victory, he will have the strength to restore this past role of leader and bring back a high quality political debate? Peter. I think the uh, polling would um, bear that out. I think, I think you're right. I think the, uh, for example, Pew Research Group has done polling of attitudes to the US in European countries, which shows that um, America's reputation has suffered, not just from this election campaign, actually, but from the whole four years of the Trump administration, um, which uh, has been in large part an attack on the liberal international order, as you call it, that we all grew up with and we're used to um, working within. And so I think it's not surprising <laughs> that, that um, American reputation, particularly in Europe, and I would guess in uh, among Asian allies as well, has taken a, a real hit. Can uh, a Biden administration restore it? Yes. Um, it will be restored by American actions, not by American words, I think. And if a Biden administration is elected and then takes the sort of steps we've been talking about, um, rejoining the multilateral organizations, rejoining the, uh, the human rights structures, um, working with allies, uh, presenting a more um, courteous and constructive and cooperative face to the world, then yes, I think America's uh, reputation can be restored. But as I said earlier on, America has changed. Um, uh, Trump is um, a cause, but also a symptom of a changing America. Uh, he wouldn't have got the number of votes that he's got uh, in the last few days if he didn't uh, represent um, quite deep feelings in America about how they should treat the world. Um, I don't think we should imagine that um, America's reputation will go back to what it was in the 1980s and 1990s um, in the you know, immediate post-Cold War period. It's different. The multilateral order is different, as uh, Bruno and others have said. It needs to be rebuilt in a different way for a post-pandemic world. I think a President Biden would help in that, uh, whereas a President Trump would definitely try and obstruct it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Katarzyna Zmetek, uh, question uh, I would like to ask Ursula to answer. Do you think Trump's victory can lead to even stronger rise of right-wing movements in the EU and give encouragement for governments of member states like Poland or Hungary? to proceed with their nationalist approach? Ursula. May I say a word on uh, what Peter said about the of course. possibilities of, uh, before answering that question. Yes, of course. The possibilities for Biden. Uh, I'm trying to keep myself from over expectations with regard to uh, Joe Biden and his possibilities. Uh, first of all, we have to see what happens in the elections uh, with regard to uh, 
to the House and the Senate. We have uh, discussed that before. But then I also think about the things Obama, the Obama administration uh, was prevented from doing or could not do, uh, despite the uh, 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 very positive efforts. Uh, I think about, uh, we were in Paris at the time, 2012, uh, walkout from UNESCO, uh, minus 22% of the, uh, the budget, uh, and other things that um, make me cautious with all the positive expectations we Europeans tend to have uh, uh, about uh, President uh, Biden. Um, the world has changed and we have not yet fully figured out in which uh, way. Now, uh, the question of encourage, the question of role models uh, is always uh, important uh, for human beings and for um, systems, because if you can get away with things um, that have not been acceptable up to present uh, uh, standards, uh, that of course in itself uh, is a tacit, at least tacit, encouragement to follow uh, this road. And uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, has been very explicit about the things he would get away with uh, um, uh, and uh, nobody would uh, be able to stop him. Um, that uh, uh, does have an impact and that is one of the, the questions facing Europe in the sense of European unity. This is what I tried to express earlier. Uh, there are those who will congratulate uh, uh, Donald Trump very early. Uh, they will hope for special treatment uh, inside uh, uh, with the regard to uh, uh, the United States for a visit, for more attention, for more support uh, of their uh, political agenda, also of their domestic political agenda. This is inevitable. I do, on the other hand, uh, uh, have full confidence in European systems that are very different uh, and very specific in each and every country. Um, uh, to resist this kind of temptation. I must say the European Union has also involved on that issue. We call it the rule of law procedure, uh, Article 7 of the uh, Treaty on the European Union. This is our attempt inside the European Union to respond to what uh, we perceive as deficits or shortcomings in the uh, um, uh, democratic uh, systems and basic values of member states. It is very heavy procedure, it is very controversial, it is in my mind necessary to lead this in uh, particular to uh, reinforce European unity and prevent examples from abroad uh, 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 making too much of an impression. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ursula. Uh, Theo, I have two questions for you. We are at the end. Uh, one question from Vincent Guédon, uh, the question in uh, uh, one word is, what do you expect in case of uh, Biden victory uh, of Biden's policy uh, with China? And the second question is a more complex question. As the COVID-19 pandemic revealed to some extent an international economic interdependence, we are observing in most of the major powers, US included, a tendency to adopt economic sovereignty policies. And the questions are, do you think that this current trend will be sustainable? And second, does it mean that the international economic order is no more driven by globalization? Uh, Theo Bach, you have the floor. Okay, uh, the second question is quite uh, complex uh, kind of question, but uh, I already said a little bit about Biden's, uh, in my presentation, I was assuming that if Biden is elected, uh, he may have a different approach toward China. Uh, in other words, you know, he may not pursue imposing tariffs, you know, or just uh, ad hoc kind of pressure to China, rather uh, Biden will uh, try to uh, change China. Uh, in terms of their business practices, policies, uh, subsidizing, you know, state-owned enterprises uh, in in uh, accordance with the uh, 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 international rules. In other words, uh, the ultimate uh, goal to push China is not to exclude or marginalize China from the world trading system. We want to uh, accept China if China accepts, you know, kind of uh, global uh, rules and uh, uh, 
uh, opening uh, its market further. So uh, I think he will have a different approach that has an impact on uh, neighboring countries in Asia. In other words, including Korea, many countries are thinking about the so-called decoupling in terms of global value change and, and also market system and their, their own business strategies. Uh, because uh, under the Trump administration, China and the United States is sort of dividing more and more uh, as time goes by. But if Biden uh, uh, become a president, uh, he will have more systematic approach toward uh, China. One thing about uh, Korea's position is, is that uh, Korea has a very sensitive relationship with, with, with China because of North Korea. Uh, if Biden want to have a coalition rather than just unilaterally or bilaterally, if you want to have a coalition of the country, so-called like-minded mind countries to pressure, to give pressure to China, then uh, I don't know, you know, Korean government will be, uh, uh, will have a difficult time how to deal with this because uh, we have a huge economic relationship with, uh, with China. Uh, so uh, this is re really, uh, another uh, difficult uh, aspect of uh, Biden being a uh, new president of the United States. The second question uh, about the COVID-19, uh, I think Korea is taking uh, rather unique uh, kind of policies. In other words, we never lock down uh, any kind of area uh, because of uh, pandemic. So uh, in a way, uh, we, we were successful because everybody is wearing masks or you know, washing hands, all kinds of things. But uh, as time goes by, even though we did not lock down the, uh, the, the shops and areas, the business is, is really down for, for, for many, many uh, months. So uh, we are asking ourselves whether this is a good thing or not. You know? uh, we cannot completely open but we are maintaining very cautious approach uh, to the general uh, public. So um, uh, it's, it's unlike the European countries. You, are op you open up and lock, lock down again, but in, in, in Korea, we maintaining non-lockdown, but uh, still our economic activities are very, very slow. So uh, I think we are in dilemma in the future of what to do uh, if, you know, second spike also visit Korea, then uh, I don't know, it'll be very, very difficult for Korea to handle. Uh, I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much. I have a, a very final question to uh, Bruno. I think Bruno, you are the one. Uh, the question is about uh, Biden and Venezuela. Uh, is the question is, what do you expect in case of Biden's victory uh, will be the, uh, the new Biden policy or the new US policy uh, or to Venezuela. Bruno. Well, most likely it would be the end of the maximum pressure policy that the Trump administration has followed against Venezuela at present and against Cuba. Um, I would imagine that there could be a possibility for a Biden administration to try to engage with Venezuela, but through Cuba in light of the fact that the Obama administration had normalized relations between US and Cuba already, and that uh, Vice President Biden at the time, uh, because of his role, could, if elected president, could somehow use that as a bridge for some type of renewed dialogue with the Maduro administration to try to find some type of a solution to the situation. But I do think it would basically be the end of the maximum pressure that has been followed to date, uh, much like it has also been followed vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And um, so I, I think there will be a dramatic change there. Uh, thank you, Bruno. 6.30 in Europe, 2.30 in the night in Seoul. I would like to thank, first of all, uh, Theo Bark. Uh, very much. I would like to thank also uh, Bruno Stagno Ugarte, I would like to thank uh, Ursula Plasnik and uh, uh, Peter Ricketts uh, and all our students. It was a fantastic seminar and uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, stay safe and we will continue to follow the uh, US election result. Bye-bye.